Her name was Tittles. What the hell? <laughs> I've never even seen that one. All right, that's hilarious. Anyway, so Tittles got nuked. <laughs> oh my god, these original names crack me up. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a discussion over, well, probably everyone's uh, least favorite part of uh, Tactics Ogre, uh, at least uh, especially back in the day, probably a good bit of it uh, for the remake as well, but uh, we're talking about Palace of the Dead and, uh, well, kind of endgame weirdness in general. And uh, I wanted to just sort of cover what's, you know, what was different originally, what was, uh, you know, what was improved upon, what, uh, how stuff changed throughout the series, all that kind of thing. So, for one thing, um, I actually completely didn't mean to include this at all. Uh, there was something I thought that only the remake did at one point, uh, but, um, uh, but yeah, it turns out the uh, the whole idea where you can just sort of pick stuff up off the map and uh, just equip it on the spot. Um, turns out, yeah, that was just kind of always a thing, though in this particular case, this character completely doesn't need it. So, right now we're on our way to the POTD, so let's go ahead and just talk about some of the surface level differences between the two. Uh, because the overall format is entirely different uh, between the two versions. And actually, there were... Oh, geez, that's... Yeah, that's that sound effect is pretty unfortunate uh, in the uh, PS1 version. Um, it was a little bit less obnoxious than the SNES version, uh, though I will say, um, between all of the different versions of... Uh, or, or the different ports of this game, I will say, overall, I feel like the uh, the PS1 version is kind of the one to, uh, to go back to if you're curious about uh, the classic uh, Tactics Ogre. Um, so, alright, now, as far as Palace of the Dead itself goes, um, in the classic version, it was kind of a roguelike format. Um, it's kind of one of those weird old-timey tropes from, you know, ye old-fashioned game design where you had to have your 100-floor dungeon, right? Now, in the original, uh, it was just a straight, you do one floor, you move on to the next, you move on to the next, you move on to the next. It's just, you are doing every floor in there. That doesn't mean that every floor was a battle of a different kind, but you did have to go through all of the floors. Um, that's actually one of the first things that they changed in the remake, which was to allow it to be done in uh, not exactly the order that you choose, but you did have different routes that you could uh, use to get through it. Uh, certain areas had little shortcuts in there. You could eventually go back and uh, get the shortcut books to uh, skip up to 75 floors of the dang thing. So, you know, they did try their best to alleviate that. Um, additionally, uh, as we'll note pretty soon here, um, the actual uh, maps, them, well, a lot of things changed about the maps. Uh, for one thing, um, in this classic version, there is one particular map, which again, you'll see in a moment, um, that for whatever bizarre reason, whether it's a programming bug or whether it was actually intentional as a sort of nod to chess, I suppose, for whatever reason you use that map, um, there's one map that makes up the vast majority of the maps in the original. Um, and uh, th this is actually one that, in a funny twist, is only ever used once in the remake. Now, I mentioned that there were other versions as well outside of uh, these two versions of the game, because yes, technically speaking, as far as endgame dungeons, they were arguably handled in more interesting ways in some of the other games of the series. Um, I know my personal favorite was from Night of Lotus, where you didn't have to worry about going through the entire 100 floor dungeon, you just went through quest mode. And uh, funnily enough, the last two maps of quest mode were uh, were just uh, levels that looked straight out of uh, Palace of the Dead, and you got the same uh, a lot of the same items that you'd get in POTD. It, it just kind of made for a smoother experience. Like, you felt like going for an endgame dungeon, bam, you, you just hit the endgame dungeon button. Usually I'm all for, like, long-form feats of logistics when it comes to old RPGs, but you know what? Sometimes you just want to get straight to it, and POTD is one of those fairly samey experiences, whatever version you play in, um, that, uh, that sometimes you just want to get right to it, you know? Alright, so that said, uh, what did the remake change there? Well, the actual uh, layouts just changed dramatically. Uh, there's, I would say, like 15 plus different uh, types of maps down there. And in fact, recently, when I've been going through and doing them side by side, I used to think very badly of uh, the remake's POTD, and um, this time through I've actually found myself enjoying it. And I think it just comes down to mindset. Because normally when you look at this, you see, you know, this ultimate endgame dungeon or whatever else, many times, myself included in the past there, when you wanted to go through it, your first thought was, okay, I'm gonna rush through, I wanna get this particular item, you know, I want XYZ different thing, maybe you want the Snapdragons, maybe you want uh, some kind of uh, uh, some kind of particular weapon or piece of gear or whatever else. 
And that right there, like the fact that you actually knew what you would get, I would argue is one flaw of the remake. See, in many ways, like when it comes to the different maps, the route you get through, the sort of logistics involved in going through, the remake did improve things. So for example, in this one, we just go in, you go to a floor, you fight that floor. Um, you'll either run into Roderick, who will teach your team something interesting, or you'll uh, run into, uh, into a battle of some kind. Um, these battles are basically picked from a list of stuff that you haven't encountered yet. And uh, many of the times, like I would say a solid 30-40% uh, of the time, you'll be getting a unique item. Uh, the rest of the time, you will just be getting a, uh, a basically just a rando fight that's going to drop a few use items for you, something like that. Um, and uh, by the way, you may notice that this team has already been through POTD. Uh, we'll cover that in a moment, but... Um, but yes, yeah, so when you go through this one, it's it's completely random. Like, you have 100 floors that you will be going through, but the encounters that you run into are going to be different every time. And in many ways, this is kind of a good thing, because you can't necessarily bum rush towards a particular item. So the first, first thing to consider, the first three floors are always going to be the first three floors. Uh, it's going to be this map, it's going to be the Rudlam map, and then it's going to be the, uh, uh, what's her face, uh, Zaydoba, I think was her name? Whatever, the, uh, the Petrification Lady. So, those are going to be your first ones in uh, when uh, when you go through the first time, when you go through the second time, what have you. Um, the first time through, you'll be running into story fights in those locations, but this time we get one of these randomly generated fights. Now, I say generated, they're more so picked from a list. Uh, there's just a bunch of different encounters, so in this particular case, it's an ice giant, and he has ice and he has spiral, which... Spiral is very similar to uh, Blue Spiral uh, that the uh, Krakens get in the uh, uh, remake, uh, where it's a long-range water, just odds are you're probably going to die from it kind of move. Um, and you actually see many encounters like that in, uh, in the original, uh, wherein you're kind of just expected to maybe lose a unit or two right off the bat. Now in this particular case, I know we have a map with a massive elevation uh, advantage here, so I haven't really brought my uh, uh, reviving character along. But uh, one of the stereotypes uh, that's associated with the original uh, POTD here and just original Tactics Ogre in general really falls apart in the end game, and that's just how uh, death is handled. Because honestly, death gets a little silly uh, by this point in the game. Uh, you have a, I would say it's near guaranteed chance that you've probably run into uh, Revivify. I believe it does show up in uh, Chapter 4 and All Routes. I could be wrong on that. I'll admit I didn't exactly look too deeply into that one. I just know every time I've gone through this game, had Revivify, so odds are you're probably getting that drop. Uh, this was reworked in the remake, though. Uh, Revivify in this one basically is just your respawn button. Somebody dies, you charge up to 60 MP, and then or 55 MP, sorry, and then just, there you go, just like that. Your unit is right back in front of you. Um, if you've played Felseal, it works very similarly to that. You just pop them right back up in front of you, you pull them out of your pocket, and they are all ready to get back to stabbing. So, very, um, very cheap, considering, what, you know, it's literally life and death. <laughs> um, it's actually not, uh, not even in the top end of, uh, uh, spell costs in the game. Uh, in fact, it costs less than literally every single draconic spell in the game. Um, but yes, that's actually, I feel, something that was improved in the remake. Now, for a little context, in the remake, you have uh, three tiles of range if you're using a Blessing Stone, two tiles if you're using a uh, Resurrection spell. Uh, resurrection costs 100. Uh, you basically are, once again, guaranteed to get it in the end game, and you can eventually buy it. Um, but the point is not necessarily that you can use it, but the logistics behind it are a lot more difficult. Yes, the 100 MP is one thing, but, you know, with uh, things like uh, efficacy and uh, MP uh, generation bonuses, you can technically get it down to being relatively fast. The thing is that uh, Resurrection in this one will bring you back at half health and will keep you at about your same uh, recovery cost as when they died. Um, in the remake, the way that they changed it, um, and why I say it's a little bit improved in that one, is because A, you have to be close by. Like, you have to get your healer up to the front line. You're back to the spot that they were in danger in the first place, right? And then at that point, you have to revive them, but they will basically take two turns. Like, when they're downed, they will have all of their costs reset to, I believe, their highest uh, value possible. 
um, at which point uh, you'll usually have to wait quite a while until you see them showing up on the time bar again. That's usually the best time to go and actually resurrect somebody. Um, but yes, if you go and immediately resurrect somebody, realistically, they're just getting flattened by the next thing that happens to run by. Uh, because they come back at 10% health. Uh, if you have the better versions, then they come back at, I believe, like 20 or 30% health. Still, point is, it's set up in such a way that you actually have to secure the area where that unit is in before you can effectively revive somebody. So, while I personally was agreeing with uh, the often held opinion that, okay, you know, it's a little bit broken, you can just revive somebody for free, and it really isn't. Like, if you look at the logistics of it, it's really a lot more balanced than many RPGs tend to uh, to make their uh, revival systems, especially for ones with permadeath. Um, I feel it's, funnily enough, closer, closer to uh, classic XCOM, where, you know, somebody's downed, you have a chance to bring them back. Now, granted, in classic XCOM, there was a solid 90% chance, unless somebody was in power armor, that they would just instantly die, you know, from the slightest tap, but... Either way, that's just all RNG. My, my point is, you have to get your doctors close by in order for them to do their job. All right, so the reason I mention this is because Revivify um, is one of those very, very common things in Palace of the Dead, because you will likely end up spamming it constantly. And yes, the immediate thought could be something along the lines that this is, uh, you know, it, you just have to make a better team and you'll, uh, you won't run into those issues. But in many sections of this, uh, by the time you get to the end game, um, the game's trying to keep pace with you in terms of damage, and there are, well, random encounters, as you've seen, and many of them will spawn relatively close to you. And the unfortunate downside of this is that sometimes they will bum rush you with several high damage uh, area of effect moves at once, and you really just won't have much of a, much of a chance to, uh, to do any kind of first move, so to speak. Um, so you may find yourself, uh, you know, losing half your team before you've had a chance to take a turn. Uh, this is including the fact that, um, uh, between different fights you have to actually go back and, uh, fully, uh, you have to fully heal your team at the end of a fight. Actually, this right here is a pretty useful situation that happened, uh, because normally what you'd do is you'd petrify one enemy, you'd heal up your entire team, and you'd move on to the next one. This, I feel, was actually also improved in the remake, uh, since... Yes, you are recovering the entirety of your team's health uh, between fights, but honestly, all it does is save time. Uh, there's really no reason to just abuse Petrify in this one. As you've seen, you can use Charm to get them to Petrify themselves. A lot of the units will actually uh, uh, carry Petrify with them, uh, even though they have no counter to it. Um, I apologize. That's, uh, that's actually a misspeak right there. Many of them will carry counters to Petrify, but usually they won't really have much of a chance to use them because they don't actually have resistance uh, to it. Uh, nothing in here resists Petrify, and in, in fact, uh, Habarim, um, I, I forget, I believe he actually comes with Petrify, but uh, if you use Petrify with him, well, his odds are dang near 100% against every single unit in this dungeon, um, with the exception of three, which are going to be the bosses. So, and, like I said, it gets a little bit silly, uh, because, yes, Petrify can more or less nullify many of the maps. Um, you get other funny situations, again, where you just may lose units instantly and just have to spend about 20 minutes waiting for MP to regenerate to get them all back. Um, I wouldn't say that part's very fun, but there is a lot of fun in uh, the little uh, extra descriptions they give things. So, I actually didn't read the bit about the Ice Giant here, but... In the, um, in the remake, this uh, kind of fell by the wayside a little bit, because when it came to palette swaps of different units, um, they gave them the story, but they didn't necessarily change their visuals as concisely. So like in this one, you get you have the uh, the lighter green uh, alligators with like gray armor, or lizard men with gray armor, and they're the alligator men, and you know, they're basically just a palette swap, but it's a fun palette swap, you know? Um, you have the Iron Golems, which are just like the regular Golems here, except they insta-kill you. So that's fun. Um, now, I say they insta-kill you. They actually come with a with the move that you'll probably recognize as Atropos uh, from Knight of Lotus. Um, it is the same uh, animation and everything in this one, except the dragon is uh, uh, brown instead of blue. And also, they can use it at about seven tiles range instead of being point-blank. 
Um, you might potentially see the issue there when a fight spawns with three of them and they run up and drop three finishers straight into your team. <laughs> so there's also that. Now, admittedly, part of that comes down to team composition. You see, the original... Well, armor is kind of a suggestion, to be honest. Uh, actually, it's especially funny because two of the special pieces of armor you can get are right here. The Warrior Set. Uh, this was later renamed and vastly improved as the Stinky Set in the remake. But the Warrior Set in the original has a funny effect uh, in that it has the lowest resistance in the game. I believe it's 1% uh, damage resistance off each piece. Um, and it's fairly hefty, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, let's see. Worn by many people, yes. Weight 25, which I believe is around the middle of the road. Physical resistance of 1. Um, but what it doesn't tell you uh, can be seen with something else that will be showing off later. But uh, check out this lady's 100% uh, luck under all circumstances. That came from leveling up a decent bit while wearing that armor. Now, you may notice her stats look like she straight up cheated. Don't worry, this was all done using in-game mechanics. So uh, we'll explain that in just a moment, but uh, the uh, interesting thing we'll actually see here in a moment is that as a matter of technicality, you can you, you can just kind of go into these maps and, uh, well, you can do a few fights and then immediately leave. You don't really actually have to risk anything, and there is equally a chance to get uh, pretty much any of your crazy endgame items uh, in the early game as they are in the late game. Um, so I believe the odds of the higher stuff go up, but most of the like dragon magic and crazy elemental weapons and all this other stuff are just randomly generated in this dungeon. Um, I don't believe they're actually even locked into Flora's Pass 3. It's just any of these random battles can potentially drop them. There's just specific encounters for specific categories of different items. So like, for example... Uh, do we have... Okay, uh, previously Olivia was the stuff, was the one that was using the Ogre set. How she's generic, I'll once again explain in a moment. Um, but, uh, uh, but yes, the, like, for example, the Ogre items, there's just these units called Relic Knights that are just golden Terra Knights running around, and they will, uh, they will give you a piece of Ogre gear, and so you just have them now, or they have some Draconics on them, or, you know, whatever else, and that's actually probably in the next bit to go to. Uh, Draconics in Classic Tactics Ogre are more like the cut content spells. Um, they, so when they remade them in the remake, they were very similar to just kind of the um, oddly specific kind of stuff that you'd actually see in something like a DD. and d Because honestly, many parts of the Ogre series are essentially Japanese people looking at D&D &D and being like, hey, I can do that. So... I mean, it's kind of like, for example, you got Dark Souls from uh, Japanese people looking at uh, Western uh, mythologies and thinking, wow, I can do that too. I don't understand these words, but man, <laughs> Hydras are pretty sweet. So it's not too different of a thing here. So uh, you may notice actually also guns got changed. So guns in the original were infinite range, um, but you are permanently locked into that class. It's actually a funny thing because technically anyone can use any item. However, if you give a gun to anybody else, they will just use it as a club, and that's really funny to me. Um, but, uh, but yes, so let's go on to the next fight here. So let's take a look at some of the interesting things that you run into into uh, in this dungeon. Um, you may, that last fight, you may notice, didn't give us anything. So the usual stereotype is that you'll get an item for every fight. Not true. Um, you get one, I would say, one every five fights or so, maybe a little bit more than that. And their effects are a lot more understated in the original. Um, and unfortunately, this also comes with a side effect that they don't tell you what most of them do. Um, this armor, in any game, would probably be my favorite. Protective gear, said to have been worn by an Angel Knight from Heaven. Now, when you think of Angel Knights in this game, what do you think of? You know, they're flying, they're, you know, they're associated with holy stuff, they can probably exercise things reasonably well. In this one, for some reason, they make everyone's MP disappear. Not sure why they don't actually have a built-in exorcism ability. You actually have to give them an exorcism spell. Anyway, do you see anywhere on this thing that it uh, gives you passive health regeneration? No, you don't. Um, um, and in fact, uh, that kind of applies to a lot of items here. Like, in many cases, the upgrades don't seem like upgrades at all and or don't really explain things terribly well. Like, for example, the reason I have him using the Zepulos, aka the Zephyros, um, so, 
you know, one of the four wind god weapons is because it's supposed to be the strongest wind weapon that he can use that isn't immediately point blank range. So strength 35. Technically speaking, evil spear over here is strength 43. Um, it's supposed to be a massive increase. Uh, yeah, it's like eight points of damage, whereas using a wind element boosts him by about 15%. But think about that for a second. 35 for a unique, like, and a just completely top tier weapon, right? Um, because in this one, there is no real damage threshold. It's just kind of like attacks and resistances instead of anything else. We look at Balder over here. What does it have? 32. The difference between the like the standard store-bought spear and this ultimate weapon of you know literally pulling a just a random uh, D and D uh, end boss kind of situation out of the Palace of the Dead is three points. <laughs> it's uh, a little goofy uh, as far as that goes. So yeah, many of the upgrades don't really feel like upgrades when you get them in, in the classic one. That took me by surprise. I'll be honest, I expected a lot more, like something similar to Night of Lotus, where you got it and it had a use item and it had a really noticeable effect on their stuff. Um, less so in, in classic Tactics Ogre, but you know what, they're alright. Like, Angel Shield here, it just says it's a holy shield. Um, it actually protects you from a really random selection of debuffs. Um, you have stuff like the Chaos Bow here, uh, it just says it contains dark powers. Um, this became the Centilodal's Rib uh, in the uh, remake. Um, uh, so basically got changed to the long range option. It's the Charm Bow in this one. Uh, you had stuff like the Star Bow here. This later became the Crescent. And uh, later in the remake actually became the um, the, uh The Crescent and the Cupido were closer to the original Chaos Bow. The Crescent was basically, in my opinion, the Crescent was probably dropped where it was with no additional effect, kind of in the center of the game around like the 20, level 24 mark. Um, only as uh, as just a little nod to the fact that that's usually when you'd get it, and the remake goes way farther than most of the rest of the series does. Um, so yeah, the, uh, the Star Bow, just basically long-range bow uh, with a stun effect on there. Now, it says it belongs to Holy. I, some of the best weapons in this game are Dark and Holy, but you can't necessarily take too much advantage of that. Um, stuff that's aligned with Dark is fairly uncommon. Um, and, like, things like gremlins and demons and things like that still have normal elements. Th I mean, this kind of just continues on. I could go down every item, more or less, uh, but basically that's kind of what it comes down to. Um, like this one right here, you got uh, the Jiggle Bow, which, w which was Gilga <laughs> in this one, except it's just called the Dark Bow. Um, many of the There's a lot of endgame items that have additional effects, but it just won't tell you. That's kind of the main takeaway here. Um, as far as set effects, actually many of them did get uh, get changed as well. So like right here, uh, again for reference, this is from one time through Palace of the Dead. So you do get way more items in the original. You just don't necessarily feel like they're that much of a leap in power a lot of the time. It just it, it you know it's just kind of like oh you know you get a fancy sword, you get a fancy sword, you get a fancy spear <laughs> kind of a situation. Um, but if we look at his uh, stats over here, he is basically a Knight of Lotus Lich. Um, so if you get uh, these four items, it uh, gives you perfect defense. Uh, it doesn't really render you invincible by any means. Uh, when I was testing this and actually recording this earlier, uh, I ran into a situation where, yes, it turns out he was not able to solo the entirety of Nibeth's fight um, just on account of one of his spells using a percentage scaling move. But either way, uh, the defense isn't actually the main feature of this. In fact, this entire set effect is honestly a little bit just who cares you know why because this stick right here it won't tell you but it's a, it's a you know a, a blood hammer made for this dark god or whatever else what it doesn't tell you is it is a hundred percent chance to charm at uh, i believe seven tiles so you can basically just hold this thing up you don't need the set effect uh it is just basically the instant mind control stick um you have this one which just gives you like some generic evil dark spell kind of thing uh, seems a little bit funny, you know, compared to something as good as instant mind control. Um, uh, you got stuff like this over here, which gives you double MP regeneration. Uh, doesn't tell you that either. In fact, of all of the items that I found so far, and I will admit I have not found every item and all of that kind of thing in here, but uh, there's one item that I found that actually does tell you what it does. 
And that's the Evil Choker, which uh, has changed a lot uh, since the remake, or in the remake, rather, um, because it gets changed to, I believe, uh, plus one Og Dark and then 30% uh, uh, bonus Dark damage in all circumstances. In this one, it spreads fear to those around you. So this is functionally an item that uh, works like the uh, one emblem in Night of Lotus that uh, gives you, uh, I think it's like War God or something like that, uh, that gives you a Terranite effect on anybody. Meaning that in this game, it's actually more useful to have than armor. Um, so yeah, this is a legit viable build <laughs> for Haberim here. Um, anyway, so let's move on to the next fight here, shall we? As we'll continue on, uh, you may notice I only have one of the White Knights. Uh, for the for reference, the only time that I actually lost anybody uh, when, I, when I was going through uh, POTD uh, was when I was test firing what Star Ion uh, does, because I thought it worked a little bit differently than it did. Um, which gets us to a little bit of, a, of another funny note. In the original, you got Star Ion, which uh, was later renamed and rebalanced in uh, uh, the second version, or in the remake as Heavenly Judge 1 and 2, in this one you uh, were guaranteed to get it on floor 25 of Palace of the Dead. Now, why do I say it's a little bit imbalanced? Well, A, you, if you have one of those robes there, which, let me remind you, you can just put a bunch of archers at the start of Palace of the Dead, um, have them just rain down arrows on random encounters, and there's a good chance you can just get every item in Palace of the Dead just repeatedly doing that. You don't actually have to go all the way to floor 100 to get the fancy items. Um, but if you choose uh, if you choose to do that and you wind up with your Holy or Dark Robes, you get to floor 25, you get Star Eye on, and in this case I had put it on Kashua. This is very easy to do. Um, you will have a unit that by turn 2 can vaporize all undead units on the map instantly. Now, unfortunately, this is not one of the undead fights. Um, it would be very nice if it was, but oh well. And uh, here we go. We actually got two uh, potentially unique drops in this particular fight. Uh, we got the Colcrium, uh, the aka the Unicorn Spear in this one. It's just... Here, let's uh, go down to the description here. Made from a unicorn horn. And uh, yeah, decent strength bonus. It's a physical spear. This actually, I would argue, is the best spear in the game, funnily enough, uh, despite those dark and holy and legendary wind weapons existing, because, you know, luck bonus, int bonus, plus a strength bonus, um, but it's, you know, it doesn't really have an elemental bonus. Um, in fact, the elemental bonus doesn't really even feel like it matters that much in this one, um, but all right. And then this is the other one, uh, which is the word rock, which uh, causes him to be giving a, a, go a well, golem bonus. Uh, basically, all uh, units within two tiles will be getting a morale bonus. Uh, this is something that I long assumed was actually in the original um, uh, Tactics Ogre, but unfortunately, is something that uh, only came up in Knight of Lotus, uh, where uh, you actually had a meter showing you their morale. I would have thought that this would have come up in the PS1 version. Um, unfortunately, it did not. Um, you saw Dragos, by the way, there on that Iron Golem. That is that move I talked about earlier, and we're actually just going to go ahead and let this uh, Basha lady run up and uh, solo this entire map. Which uh, gets us to our next thing. How is it that certain units, like, you know, my uh, Spear Lady over there, are able to run through soloing entire maps without cheating? You know, this is this is the hard one, right? This, <laughs> this is the one that was supposed to be more balanced, right? Um, yeah, not, not so much. Uh, you can, at any one of those random map rerolls, find a spell called Retissue. So it's very, very goofy. Um, basically, what it does um, is something that uh, came back in the remake in three separate ways. So what it does is turn a skeleton back into a person. Doesn't sound too busted, right? It's, you know, it's a skeleton. What could they possibly do that a person can't? The thing is, it's not the transformation itself that's actually powerful. <laughs> in fact, the transformation barely matters at all. Skeletons, I would argue, are one of the best units in this uh, in this game. In fact, um, when I was doing the tier list, I definitely didn't give them en enough justice, because Basha here was originally a skeleton. Uh, they were a random skeleton I got through in my first time through Palace of the Dead, and they were just a random generic skeleton that uh, I had the option to finish off, and I was like, you know what? Um, I'm just going to go ahead and talk to them, and uh, they ended up joining. And yeah, their stats were all under 200, which, considering that they haven't 
they're actually a lower level, or they're actually now at the same level as when I first got them, makes it a little bit strange that their dexterity is now over 400. So, the funny thing about Retissue is that it, for whatever reason, allows them to keep their original stats, and then allows you to then keep half their health, but restart at level 1. <laughs> Meaning that they suddenly can go break the level cap, uh, as well as instantly level up from just about anything, and, um, yeah, they, uh, <laughs> they just very quickly end up uh, doubling up on all their stats. And there's nothing preventing you from doing this more than once. You can do this as much as you want. And, uh, in fact, that's the reason I'm only sending her ahead here, because uh, Dragos might end up uh, one-shotting anybody else. Meanwhile, she ends up one-shotting their leader. <laughs> so that's always fun. Um, yet, yeah. now the funny thing about this is that they actually did reference this in the remake. Um, in fact, it's the entire leveling system, if you think about it. Because, okay, think about it. Whenever you get a new class, you then go and you just transform them into that other class, and you start back at level 1. And then you slowly get a chance to build up very tiny amounts of stat points in the background. Obviously, it is way more sane in the remake, uh, but if you ever wondered where that system came from, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's where it's from, because it's literally the retissue loop, but they made it not crazy. Um, it is still a little bit weird to internalize, <laughs> like, in terms of why that's all happening, but it's actually not that unheard of. In fact, even historically, um, if you read over bits of, uh, well, pretty much any part of European wars or whatever else, which, by the way, this guy's using the equivalent of Atropos, and, uh, what a shame. He can't even do anything with it. Um, yeah, this literally hurts him more than, uh, than her. <laughs> Oh, man, it's funny. Um, in fact, I should probably go get uh, Olivia down there as well. This whole retissue loop is actually how Olivia wound up as a neutral, or not neutral, but how she wound up as a uh, generic witch. You see, because she, uh, well, she was my main healer for a decent bit. She was my main revive user. And uh, then she randomly got sniped around floor like 98 or something at Palace of the Dead. And I didn't realize. Um, well, I wasn't really paying attention, because I also have an Angel Knight on the team, and I thought, uh, I must have just brought them instead. I just was completely not paying attention. Uh, because in this one, um, in the original version, as well as Knight of Lotus, if you have the, uh, requirements, you instantly transform into an Angel Knight on death. So, um, uh, you know, she got shot in the face, she turned into an Angel, and that was that. Um, actually... One side note before we get going, you may notice there, he had the opportunity to take the loot, and he did not. That right there was a major misstep for the remake, in my opinion. There is logic behind it. Um, basically, the AI is just trying to take uh, trying to take strategic tiles. Um, it technically plans out... I forget exactly how this goes, but they like try to plan it out based off different locations of different units. Um, you can kind of feel it out eventually, but... Uh, but basically, it leads to an unfortunate side effect where they will take your uh, your loot uh, a good bit of the time. Now, in the original, it seems like they avoid it. Um, they seem to prefer to take tiles that are uh, free of anything, which is pretty nice. Now, back on those transformations. So, yeah, angels instantly get transformed into, in the remake, uh, they actually reference the other half of that retissue loop, because that's how you get angels in that one. You turn somebody into a zombie, then you turn them into a skeleton, then you turn that skeleton into an angel, and you have to bring them all to specific locations. It's an asinine way to do it, but, you know, I honestly, I can kind of respect it, because, like, at least they tried. <laughs> they tried to do something different. It wasn't a good idea. It just was a neat idea. So, all right. Now, another thing, because we're not going to run into her here, and... Dang it, I should have looked at the Warren Report before coming in here. Um, but when it comes to this version, um, uh, what's her name? Uh, Vespa, Vespal, whatever. Uh, she's actually very different. Um, she's So in the remake, you fight her in San Branta. She's the one that introduces you to how to make Angel Knights. You actually have three uh, different uh, fights that introduce you how to make Angel Knights. And in fact, the guide tries to make a really good case for them by, uh, by saying that they're the strongest unit in the game. They're not, but, you know, they tried. They tried to sell them. But in this one, uh, she actually has a completely different mission. So in the remake, she's basically researching how to bring people back from the dead. Uh, so she's basically Holy Nibeth, more or less. 
Uh, in this version, uh, she's a spy that Branton asks to go look for elemental nukes. And uh, whether she finds it or she's given Star Ion, actually, I believe she has the Jesus lasers. Um, and then she ends up dropping Star Ion it's, instead. It's basically the same spell, except this one doesn't have any international issues after 9-11. Um, so there's that. All right, so this is kind of the, you know, kind of the original experience. You go through, uh, through map after map after map. But yeah, we haven't gotten into the majority of the Palace of the Dead yet. This is still the intro. This is still the part where, you know, they're pretending that it's going to be like the remake, right? Um, so, okay, we'll just put him there. We're gonna have a big open map for this next one, so lots of archers. It's tactics over. You gotta have the archers. Um, but, okay, basically the creativity runs out after this one. <laughs> this is just sort of where they took a lunch break and then never came back to it. Um, because, yeah, most of the rest of it is just randomly generated battles with a couple of boss fights in there, and then the rest of it is just those same random encounters that you've already seen on an allegedly uh, random selection of maps. But, like I said, whether there's a programming error or what, it seems like most, uh, again, about 90% something of those maps, unfortunately, are going to be the map that's used for the shops and the one general fight uh, in, the, uh, in the remake. All right. So, here we go. It's just five units. You may notice that 5v10 is not a super fair fight. This leads to kind of maps deciding whether or not the fight is actually going to be interesting. Because some of them legitimately can be. Uh, for example, you run into this fight a decent bit of the time. This is one of the completely generic ones. And those Gorgons can make a huge difference. Because if one of them ends up uh, hitting uh, many members of your team... Uh, Petrify actually works very different in the original. Uh, so you may have a very hard time getting your team back up to snuff. Um, but yeah, by and large, by and large, it just kind of comes down to who gets their big move off first. It's like she's going to go for a shot here. I mean, you got to respect the effort, but uh, that just that just ain't going to work. So there we go. Evil Eyes. Um, monster units in the original do not have a bar. Uh, they used SP in Night of Lotus, which I believe was probably the best way to do it, uh, wherein they just said... You know, you have you have this special meter. You can't charge it by any means. It just goes up over time. So they literally just just have a recharge on their moves. Um, the TP bar method in the remake worked because it you know just combined with everything else. Um, but I wouldn't say it was as elegant because there were ways for you to boost it, which meant that there were some ways for it to be cheesed. So if we're talking maybe making them you know reasonably balanced or whatever else, it wasn't quite as good on that front. But it whatever. You know, honestly, the TP system, I still feel, is probably the most elegant way that they've done everything overall for the series. It's just a nice way to allow you to, uh, to kind of do more interesting special stuff. So, you may notice Petrify up there ended up hitting the guy with literal perfect defense, so it doesn't really check for that. Uh, kind of uh, emphasizes another point about the original, where uh, many skills and many defenses and things like that actually used uh, used uh, uh, stuff that didn't necessarily seem obvious. Like, with, with Petrify earlier, the reason that uh, um, uh, Habram actually has such a freakishly high accuracy with the thing, which I'll show off in the next fight, I actually meant to find him in the last one. Wait a second, the guy's name is Jad. Apparently we've, uh, we've entered RuneScape territory here. Actually, funnily enough, one of the builds on this team is a RuneScape reference. Um, but, uh... Oh, what was I getting at? Oh, yeah, so just stuff scales very differently in this one. Uh, so Petrify scales off agility for whatever reason. Um, you have uh, uh, you have stuff like charm moves, I believe. I think it also scales off direction in this one. I know it did in the remake. Um, but in the remake, in many cases, you could get uh, kind of get past some of those times when you ran into a character that didn't really have the stats for a particular spell you wanted to use. Um, not by grinding, but, for example, giving them something like Spell Strike. Uh, wherein you could just say, okay, I just want you to be more accurate with debuffs overall. Which, by the way, Ripple Staff uh, allows you to instantly vaporize undead in this one. That's pretty handy. Um, in fact, th that's kind of the reason that I have uh, her as a witch. <laughs> because she's, uh, uh, she's actually um, uh, more or less the same character that she was before, just a little bit more aggressive now. She still has heal rain for the healing. She still has exorcism from her... Uh, 
uh, from her uh, Ripple staff. Um, by the way, Flying Ring, you don't actually get it down here. I think you can get one down here. Um, but I auctioned off a, uh, a Cockatrice to Elmorica to get that. Uh, that they did legitimately take out in the remake, but we'll get onto more of that in a second. So, back on a, on a topic that I've wandered miles away from at this point. Olivia, how on earth did she wind up in that state? So, she got uh, turned into an angel. I tried reviving her over and over. It didn't quite work out that way. Um, so then I tried turning her undead and then generic, and it turns out there's actually a fun little detail in the original where if somebody gets turned undead, they get turned chaotic and take a massive uh, uh, loyalty loss, which, you know, that's that's cute. You gotta appreciate the detail on that. Um, actually, before I forget, I'm not gonna have him finish the fight. I wanna show what the, uh, the melee with the gun looks like, because I think he'll still do it if... Uh... Yeah, there we go. They just use it as a club. This is funny. Um, but yeah, so she got turned generic, um, at which point, uh, technically there's nothing preventing her from using the Ogre Blade, uh, which actually does have an identical effect in the, uh, classic version here, meaning that, technically speaking, if you were to have, you know, Kashua go through this whole process, that she gets shot, gets turned into an angel, gets turned into a skeleton, gets turned back into a person, is given the Ogre Blade, is then, uh, then uses the Ogre Blade on a, let's say, a griffin, um, I forgot to open the dang door. All right, that's fine. That's fine. Well, uh, if you don't open the door even on subsequent run-throughs, it doesn't let you through. That they did change in the remake, because that crap is annoying. <laughs> but, um, either way, we'll uh, we'll, we'll show what uh, what the later maps look like. So, okay. So technically speaking, if she went through that whole process and then was auctioned off uh, in Heim, that would effectively create a history for this universe where you know. If a uh, chicken kebab were then bought at the store and given to Denim, um, history would forever have to try to explain why this uh, empire fell apart because the king ate the queen. Um, anyway, so let's go ahead and... Uh, it, yeah, if you ever wondered why generics couldn't do a lot of that stuff in the, uh, in the remake, that's probably why, or why they turned into different stuff in Night of Lotus. You know, there's that. Now... A little side note I want to circle back to here on the different versions that the different games pulled. Because there's actually a few mechanics that have changed throughout the series that I thought were kind of fun. So, first of all, funny note, this is actually the cockatrice I later auctioned off to get that flying ring. But okay, the other versions of uh, Palace of the Dead, right? So the, the end game, you know, mega dungeon and whatever else is something that's been around in every one of these games to some degree. Um, I believe it was the uh, it was just an extra uh, extra map in OB64. Uh, March of the Black Queen arguably had one of the more interesting ones, wherein you had to uh, go through a series of challenge maps using units that weren't your own. So that's kind of cool. Um, that I actually have never gotten to try yet, so I'm looking forward to trying that at some point. Uh, hoping to start covering some of this more out there stuff <laughs> for these games. Um, for uh, Night of Lotus, I already mentioned it was quest mode. And then, technically, they expanded uh, the role of Palace of the Dead into a whole bunch of different areas for the remake, because you ended up uh, getting all of the, like, uh, Star Ion and uh, some of your uh, more holy-affiliated stuff uh, that all went to the San Bron Bronze of Ruins. You went to some of your, uh, a lot of your elemental vests and things like that got scattered to the wind. Um, a lot of them all over Palace of, or not Palace, but uh, Pirate's Graveyard. Uh, the elemental temples ended up getting a lot of the fancy elemental weapons, which made a lot more sense. Like, it just kind of felt like stuff... I don't know, it, it, it got to more places. Um, it was far from perfect, that's for sure. But either way, I think they actually handled it a lot better than... Uh, well, I know than I originally thought uh, for, uh, for the remake. They did legitimately put a lot of thought <laughs> into pretty much every detail here. Um, Alright, so let's go ahead and ice this guy. Uh, another funny note they changed between the two, uh, double attack works very different in this one. So, in the classic version, you had several classes that had a double attack available to them, um, but it just was built into the class. So, the sword master could use two swords, uh, the ninja could use two daggers or two claws, which claws were originally one-handed, um, and then uh, I believe the lord could also use double swords, or just could double up on a lot of things. Uh, nobody could use double axes as far as I'm aware. Um, and that's kind of that. Uh, crossbows. There were originally two crossbows. Uh, well, no, there were three. 
Um, these were the equivalent of the bow gun, uh, the uh, Kranikin plus one, and the um, uh, the rude bow, um, which were just, I believe it was a bow gun, Gemini, and uh, a holy bow in this one. By the way, this is the uh, <laughs> the, the uh, RuneScape build I was talking about. They just do this thing, and they they do the spear, and then they push. They do a push move. That That's it. That's the joke. All right. So, so that changed. Uh, finishers, by the way, um, they have always been in the game. Uh, again, I thought that this was a, a complete like remake fabrication because they wanted to uh, reference. Uh, um, uh, they wanted to reference Vagrant Story, which yes, every finisher in the remake is from Vagrant Story, in name only though. They function very differently. So, um, uh, so yeah, it, you basically had four ranks or eight ranks, but uh, you got a finisher for every one of those ranks. And, uh, yeah, all the names were the same. Their functions were very different. Their animations were very different. But uh, it was just a cheeky little reference there. Uh, in this one, uh, all of your finishers don't come from mastering anything, uh, but from running into Roderick in Palace of the Dead. So I don't think we'll... Um... All right, she's, she's just going to sit there. So I don't think we'll get a chance to run into him uh, because this is kind of like right at the uh, right at the end here. But, uh, yeah, basically what happens is Roderick pops up. He says, hey, how's it going, Mr. Dude Guy? Um, you, uh, you want to go fight Dorgi? So do I. Well, that's fantastic. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's go ahead and, uh, get you some finishers. This one's good for somebody with claws or spears, and it's a really good move, and you should totally learn it. And then, he, like, he comes up with this, with this menu that's a little bit strange, because it actually threw me for a, for a loop at first. Um, by, by the way, there you go. There's a revify, just like resurrection, except you can pop them back anywhere and they have half health. Um, but yeah, uh, basically what it does, it takes you to your, uh, to your normal menu and it says, Hey, would you like to learn this move? And it always uh, starts off on denim. And so the assumption, I know my f assumption looking at it first was like, Hey, are you trying to teach this to denim? Which I wasn't. Um, so, you know, no, I don't want to teach it to Denim. Oh, well, you, you know, say goodbye to this move forever, and then it's just gone. <laughs> so, never say no. The answer to that first question is yes. Yes, you do want to teach it to, uh, to somebody, because uh, then it finally allows you to go and look through your entire menu. Um, I'm sure I can't be the only one that ran into that little confusion. Um, original version here, you definitely had to look through that particular animation a lot. Uh, can't really call that a positive. Um, because, yes, a lot of characters use AoEs, um, use the high-level AoEs and things like that. So you'll t typically see a whole lot of uh, little uh, effects running in a circle. Now, let's talk about Draconics real quick, because I haven't touched on those yet. So while the, the Warlock was basically a one massive D&D reference with a bunch of very oddly specific skills uh, in the, uh, the remake, so, for example, Healcraft doesn't seem like it would do much, but technically speaking, if you were... Just like the recent video covered, if you were to use it on somebody with a warlock, it would end up actually lasting a unusually long time. See, in this one, um, well, actually in the remake, um, a lot of things is, uh, had their uh, uh, had their actual longevity based uh, based uh, uh, scaling off of mind, meaning that a character with really high mind, like a warlock, there could potentially make debuffs that lasted a very long time, which made them an excellent debuff caster. Um, so the cool thing there is that, uh, yeah, with Healcraft, if you used it off of a card, which is probably the most obvious way to do it, um, you potentially would have a bit of a bad time because it just would last a couple rounds and that was it. If you used Fairy Powder, which you had to buy from the store, it would last about seven, eight something rounds. So decent enough to be worthwhile if you have somebody that's spamming a, a major heal and stuff like that. But uh, if you have... For example, um, a bit of a different story there where you have a Warlock coming in that's going to give them a, uh, a really uh, decent boost uh, uh, to their mind score and everything else. They end up having Healcraft that ends up lasting, you know, the whole rest of the fight ends up being a bit more useful in their hands. Is that a mega niche case? Oh yeah, absolutely. Everything about it is just super niche and honestly I kind of respect it more after, uh, after seeing all that. So okay, let's see if we can uh, show this off here. Okay, he does five damage if he were outside of fear range. Now let's go ahead and get close. Still does five there. So I believe his... 
I, I want to test something real quick here because I believe the uh, the fear choker um, actually takes effect after the turn's over. Uh, because fear in this one really drops stats severely. So next we're going to also put denim over there. Uh, fear choker and terror knights, uh, possibly also multiple terror knights, do actually stack. Uh, meaning that you can completely crush somebody's stats. Um, anyway, we're uh, going to go ahead and revive the other person here. There we go, poof, and suddenly the entire team's back from the dead. It, like, they literally just become death fodder. Um, no, he still does five. Okay, then I guess that one doesn't scale terribly well. It's also probably because he's petrified now that I think about it. Hmm. Oh, well. That's fine. We'll test it some other time, but it does stack. I know that for a fact, because I saw a case where somebody had 100% accuracy, which went down to 3% uh, when surrounded by those two characters. So it's pretty noticeable. Um, oh, by the way, circling back to set effects. I didn't mention earlier, uh, but that dark road set that um, uh, Donalto has, which, by the way, yes, I did turn him into a lich just so he could out-lich the lich that was making fun of him at the start of the game. Um, its effect is changed to fear, slow, and hobble in the remake. So basically it just completely shuts down anybody that's nearby them. But anywho... Uh, which, by the way, here is pre-getting completely annihilated Olivia with an intelligence score that's half of what it was in the other one. Okay, so, um, thing on armor in this one. So, you probably heard before, you know, the whole thing of, you know, tactics over armor is worthless. Uh, yes and no. So, in the original, yes. In many cases, it's honestly a lot heavier than, uh, uh than it would really make sense. Um, like, it's resistance, like, okay, <laughs> you got... 25, uh, 25 physical resistance. To my understanding, that's literally just taking 25 damage off. For the ogre stuff, that's kind of what you would expect off of standard endgame armor and Knight of Lotus and all that kind of thing. Not the exact numbers, but I mean in terms of effect. But it's not super noticeable most of the time unless it's an elemental resistance. Like, for example, uh, in a previous recording of this that completely broke for reasons I don't quite understand... Her having three holy items was enough to make Mi uh, Nibeth never target her, uh, despite a 11-level uh, difference between them. But uh, either way, uh, for the most part, um, armor kind of just boils down to you want to only use ones that have a special effect on there. Personally, I end up putting pieces of armor on people just kind of for the hell of it. I like the idea that they're carrying it with them. It honestly doesn't make a huge... like it. I, I feel like... A couple of reviews that I've seen out there from, you know, folks that were, like, professionals of the genre and all that kind of thing kind of got carried away with, like, oh, it's just ruining your odds of winning. It makes the game so much worse to wear armor. Like, no, just, it reduces damage. I mean, it's not awful, but it, it just doesn't work very well in the original. In the remake, though, it's a totally different story. But, like everything about the remake, they didn't bother to tell anybody how it works. So it's like a damage threshold system in the remake, and so... Once you get past armor, like, it just blows past armor. They get a bunch of bonuses and whatever else, which led to a lot of people going, like, oh, the armor's worthless. Look, I can get past this with rank 8 augments and rank 8 bows. <laughs> like, yes, you have maxed out ranks and damage and bonuses. That's going to get past armor. That's kind of how an RPG works. <laughs> so... Uh, it just kind of cracks me up. But yeah, on like for normal day-to-day -day stuff and for actual sane ranks that people would be running around with in the remake, it does its job very well. Um, even at max rank, like a full worm scale suit plus a shield is honestly going to reduce their damage below 100. So it's either way, it's far more worth it in the remake. Um, it felt a lot better in Knight of Lotus because you usually tended to see a unit take many more hits at one time and just everybody was more tanky in general. So when you saw somebody running around like full plate, you know, uh, uh, iron helmets and, you know, tower shields and things, they looked pretty darn tanky because they were just extra tanky in a sea of tanks. So I would say Knight of Lotus probably felt the most obvious. Um, mechanically, I would say the remake is the most sound, especially uh, with the One Vision mod. Because um, it tended to make everything a lot more understandable, but um, but yeah, in the in the original, honestly, it's a lot more for flavor. Um, and in fact, uh, many of the pieces of equipment. Uh, actually, one very positive note on the remake here. So you see stuff like uh, here. Let me find somebody that has it. Like right here, like the fire armor, phoenix armor, whatever you want to call it. Um, 
I know I always assumed this, and a lot of people that play Tactics Smoker assume this, that, uh, that it would work like FFT or something like that, that you equip that armor, and suddenly you're better at using fire. And you ain't. Um, it does work that way in March of the Black Queen. I don't know if it actually does that in OB64. We'll admit, I've not played OB64 that much. I've run it like three times. I've been through the game three times, but as far as knowing its deeper mechanics, I wish I had a more convenient way of going through it, but either way. Um, so yeah. In the remake, however, it seems like they took that uh, they took that assumption to heart, and yes, it does actually boost your, uh, your fire abilities. Um, it gives you a plus one fire, as well as the ability to, uh, at, I believe it's attenuate or instill, depending on your item. Um, so, you know, it's nice. Instead of just being uh, straight up resistance, it'll resist different stuff based on what it looks like and, like, you know, better crush defense if it's got more, uh, uh, more, uh, flexible areas on there. Uh, more plates gives it more stab defense, all that kind of stuff. Now, all right. So yeah, this one gives you water resistance. You, you really don't see those extra resistances come up that often. But that's just kind of a random detail. All right, so originally I was actually planning on getting two Draconics at some point, wasn't I? Okay, so Draconics are very funny in this one because they almost feel like they didn't finish making them. <laughs> so, all right, let, let's go over the list of what I have here. I'm missing four of them, or I, I know I'm missing some of them. So first off, Snapdragon is just Snapshot in this one. It takes the Warlock, turns them into a weapon, and you get, you get the spell back. So you can just reuse a snapshot um just make however many uh, snapdragons you want um so it works uh, kind of like knight of lotus except you know it's just a spell in this one so you just you would have to train up a new warlock but they are a weapon now uh i mean it works it's just when something like retissue exists where you don't have to sacrifice a unit you know it's it, it, it's honestly a bit pointless in this one um, I would say Knight of Lotus definitely had the most noticeable one because it had, like, the most ways that a weapon could really come out, like, at least for one weapon type. Uh, Remake handled it clumsily, but I could see where they're going, uh, where they're coming from on that one. Um, because basically you had one weapon of every type, you just found one in Palace of the Dead. You could only get one, but then you had any person that could wield it, um, use its effect. They get eaten by the weapon, which, by the way, I legit had an Iron Man run once where somebody got eaten by the two-hander, and then just a random enemy came and stole them. <laughs> just, oh, man, that sucked so bad. Anyway, um, so and at any rate, um, just takes their stats, turns them into a weapon. You just have swords in this one. Uh, in the remake, you had one for every weapon type, but it would basically, it was a mix of RNG, their own stats, and their skills, and all that kind of stuff, as well as their current weight for some reason, which meant that, there really was no question about the fact that if you wanted your best Snapdragon, you would have to have somebody that was pretty much maxed out across the board. You give them a, a fire crest, and you actually have a weapon that weighs a negative 10, which is pretty funny. So as far as the amount of effort that would be required to create a mega weapon in that one, I gotta respect it. Um, but And also the fact that you could use them at level 1. You can do some really funny shenanigans with that. Uh, Knight of Lotus was definitely the simplest to use. In this one, I feel it's kind of like, kind of just kind of redundant when something like Retissue exists. You can just take your existing unit and double their level. <laughs> like it, it's pretty uh, unreasonable that Retissue is even that it even works that way. I assume it's a bug. It had to have been a bug. I even went and double checked through interviews if anybody ever asked what the hell the deal was with Retissue. Please, if you know, like if you if you've seen that in an interview at some point. Please tell me. I gotta know how the hell that got past balancing. All right. So next we have the big AOE nukes, right? So there's a bunch of different flavors of these. Um, you have you have the holy and dark ones, which kind of have unique stuff to them. You have the uh, draconic ones, which have their own stuff to them, and then you have the elemental versions uh, from the elemental temples, which do their own thing. So the elemental uh, temple versions work similarly to the. If I recall correctly, please bear in mind that some details might be off on this, but they should work the same as death over here, where they hit both sides of the map. Um, so they'll hit both teams. Uh, they cost 60, and they just do raw damage. 
So just a big, raw, meaty explosion. Now, the draconic versions are different. So Mute is basically Galaxy Stop from FFT. Uh, Wipeout is a similar thing, but it's special effect. Uh, so, oh, sorry. Sorry, I know. Stop stopping. Mute, like I said, it's basically Galaxy Stop. It hits everybody on the map with paralysis. Um, I don't know what stat it checks for. Probably mind. Um, but it has a very high success chance, even with a fairly crappy Warlock over here. Uh, Tempest, I believe, weakens weapon power. Uh, Wipeout... Tempest and Wipeout, I might be getting mixed up here. One of them weakens weapon power, the other just uh, basically burns the tile underneath them to turn into a rock tile. I mean, random, but okay. And then the other one, I don't believe does anything, it's just raw damage. Um, I don't have the other one, though. Uh, Dominion, it, it just stops uh, somebody from moving for a while, so... Again, very, I don't know, very lame in the grand scheme of the other Draconic spells here. And then Entify is interesting because it kind of, uh, I assume this must have come up when trying to balance out Palace of the Dead. Uh, because Entify basically self-destructs your Warlock in order to bring somebody back to life. Meaning, if your healer gets sniped and you have Entify, then suddenly your Warlock can bring your healer back to life, which can then revive everybody else. It's a very... D&D, &D, I'll allow it kind of moment um, for that one. So I just thought that was kind of neat. Um, all right, so... All right, I want to take a quick second to explain how the uh, undead units changed in the two versions. So you know how they have the joke in the remake where... Um, uh, when you see Don Donalto for the first time, he tries to use exorcism on a skeleton, and it doesn't work, and he says, oh crap, everything's changed in the last 15 years, you know, dang kids making the skeletons different. Basically, that's what, how it worked in this one. So, you used exorcism on a standing skeleton, instantly vaporized, that was the end of that. Um, the funny thing is, uh, that it actually allowed for a build like this. So, there's a move called Devil Cry here. That would be risky on anybody else, but if you happen to run into this in POTD and put this on a skeleton, um, basically what it says, it'll take whatever amount of health you have and uh, pretty much deal everything short of like 10 health or something to an enemy unit. It'll dump your HP bar as damage. The cool thing is, uh, the skeleton will then get immediately knocked out. A knocked out skeleton cannot be killed by any means aside from, and I haven't tested this, theoretically being knocked off a cliff with a shield bash, which is only like 50% chance to even work in this one anyway. So, functionally speaking, this is a move that lets them be a, a immortal glass cannon. They, they just become an obsidian cannon. <laughs> it's pretty, it, wait, is obsidian? No, no, I forget if obsidian's... I think that's the one that cracks easily, isn't it? You know what? Let's just call them the titanium cannon. There we go. Um... Also, there's a lot of undead versions. Uh, this is this one isn't undead, but there's a lot of undead units uh, in the Palace of the Dead. For some reason, most of them get Charm Breath instead of their standard stuff. Not sure what that's all about. Uh, Hydras in the original are god tier. Like, oh my god, they're so good. <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous. Um, right, let's have another random map here. It's got 98, basically the same as the others. I think you can kind of see what I meant about uh, the uh, the drops on this one. Like, it's it's going to be pretty random, frankly. Um, I want to... So, all right, let's talk the differences, though. So, when it comes to the effects of all of these different drops, that one does feel very different. Because, um, because while the drops were generally rarer and they were set to particular maps... For the remake, I kind of feel like that was kind of a good thing because they, ch when uh, when they actually changed them, they gave them a lot of extra effects. Uh, they gave them a lot of different factors to consider. I mean, they had a four-page, you know, thing of different considerations for the, for any given weapon, for example, instead of just uh, instead of just being a thing that gives you a strength bonus, because it isn't like you get a strength bonus, you get a vit bonus, you get an attack bonus, you get a you know. Uh, weight and use, but well, you do have weight and stuff like that in this one. But um, but yeah, you uh, you had your uh, stat bonuses plus your attack bonuses, defense bonuses, health whatever bonuses. You had all kinds of bonuses all over the dang place in the remake. So my favorite example of this is the dark spear, which uh, uh, which Gildas is using in this one. Uh, wherein in this one it's just it's a spear. It does it adds forty five to your attack strength. 
because all it does is check stats. It's not like the weapon itself is really doing very much. It's just boosting that stat by that much. So what happened in the um, in the remake, or sorry, what happened in the original was, yeah, it's just plus 45. It resists uh, wholly a little bit. End of story. That's what it does. Um, it's actually a uniquely bad introduction to a weapon for that particular one because everything in Palace of the Dead seems to come with resistances to dark, meaning that it just comes off feeling very lame in this particular setting. But if we look at the one in the remake, suddenly you got to be level 48 to even use the dang thing. It's got this uh, long range on there. By the way, side note on the long range uh, pikes that they suddenly turn into. Yeah, you know what? I actually like that feature now too. Reason being... Um, I see where they were coming from. In this one, it's very often that you would wind up uh, wanting to keep your spear guys behind everybody else and just have them throw out those uh, long-range pokes. Um, actually, recently when I've been going through Palace of the Dead again uh, in the remake, I've been using uh, barricades and long-range pikes, and it's it's good. It's legit good. Um, it's a functional strategy, and uh, yeah, um, I kind of feel stupid for not doing it earlier because it's like... I always thought you had to put them down in order to help the crossbows or something, but yeah, no, they're clearly for uh, for pike users. So anyway, so you have this thing has a you know big old attack bonus on there, has all these stat bonuses, makes you fear proof, allows you to use paralytic wave on somebody that's not a caster. Like it just has all these you know different effects stacked up all over the place, um, and that applies to almost all equipment in that game. I honestly feel like the the remake. I used to think so much of it was just random, like they were trying to make a MMO or something, but upon comparing the two side by side, yeah, no, almost every change they made was informed by something from the original. Um, I used to think a lot of it was even based off uh, all of the forum complaints they were talking about in the interviews, but it honestly only seems like maybe three or four changes actually came from that. So. Hopefully this has done a at least decent job of explaining what goes on in the original uh, POTD here. Uh, last note I kind of want to show here is uh, the contest they had for, I think, only the PS1 version. But for anyone unaware, they actually had a contest back in the day over uh, who could be the first of 500 people to go discover the, uh, the fire seal. Um, go figure out uh, how to get the dang thing and then just send them a picture of Denim wearing it, right? And turns out, not very many people were willing to go through Palace of the Dead twice. Um, I don't think it was an odds thing either. I guess they just couldn't get people to do it because, again, this first one I didn't reload. I when I, I, I didn't reload unless there was a game over because you know PS1 version you can actually save your game. Um, but when I went through it, I uh, I ended up getting all four pieces of the set for, from the first time through. Um, basically the way that you get the fire seal is you get all four pieces of the wind god set and then you go through a second time and instead of Nibbeth that time you fight Blackmore. If um, the second time through though, um, it's I mean it's always going to be Blackmore there, it's just a generic lich in the remake um, and then Blackmore comes out only if you've uh... <laughs> I think this is the only time the retreat music is used too which is just kind of cool. Um but yeah, they did use the same retreat music in the remake. Um, but yeah, Blackmore it comes in both versions in this one, uh, whether you're doing the Fire Seal fight or not. And then if you have the Fire Seal fight, um, I believe he can just nuke your entire team instantly. Um, but Nibbeth himself isn't really that part of a fight. Right, so let's go down here. So the Fire Seal. So the ultimate treasure hidden in the Hellgate, the red gem which sealed a legendary divine dragon soul. Whenever he gets the gem as a true hero, once you find the fire seal, have the main character equip it in the status screen. Way to break the fourth wall with a bulldozer. Send a picture of it and send it to the following address. There will be a drawing of 500 winners and they will be notified by mail. Please understand that we cannot answer questions regarding it since it may ruin the game. And yeah, funnily enough, apparently only one guy did that. <laughs> and they sent him a helmet, so that's kind of neat. Um, uh, I know some guy did a um, like a full thing on that a little while ago. Um, another fun little difference between the two, by the way. Um, there is a slight wording difference uh, when it comes to one of the new stories in the original and in this one. So, let's see here. Da, 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 da. Yeah, the freak explosion thing. So, the Hellgate in this one, uh, they mentioned that uh, many never come back. 
Um, it's just basically implied that people know about the Hellgate. They know it's going to be there. Um, but not many people ever make it back, which sort of explains why some of the kind of items and whatever else are out in the world, but there's basically a complete uh, lack of them. In fact, one rumor that I heard that was very untrue about the original and um, that a lot of folks seem to hold near and dear was that you could get so many elemental options in this original version and then you were stuck using generic gear for way longer in the remake. Um, you ended up getting a few pieces of elemental items earlier on, but by and large, you actually have far more options in the remake. Um, just they don't necessarily get to all of the crazy elemental stuff until about the same time, um, at which point uh, then they also add a second tier of elemental stuff, while this stuff just has seemingly one version of each one. Um, Actually, one thing they changed in the remake that was a solid change, uh, for sure, or, sorry, uh, one thing that they did in the remake that was a cool reference that they did actually ruin in the remake was the Holy Crown. Uh, anyone unfamiliar? Um, basically, in the in the original, uh, Kashua comes with the only crown, because she just got promoted into Princess, which basically just, it's it's a it's a March the Black Queen reference. You get a regular Amazon, you get them, you give them a crown, they turn into a princess, in this one, she's basically a random priest, and then she gets the crown and she gets turned to a princess. That's it's kind of the little happy nod there. It was kind of a cool one. Um, also, if you, if for some reason you're looking at this and you didn't know, uh, yet yeah, the uh, the orbs uh, they give negative weight in the original. Um, I'm pretty sure most folks know about this by now. Um, this was something that the fire seal did in the remake, uh, but yeah, in this one they just have negative weight for whatever dumb reason. Um, but they uh, will essentially nuke the entire map if you decide to use one. You do have some encounters in Palace of the Dead that will, for example, be a, a like the Wind God encounter. They don't always use it, but I think they have like a 25% chance to just run up and use a Wind Orb and wipe away half your team. So that's always neat, um, considering their stats are freakishly high, and that's what they scale off of. Um, let's see, fairies also... Yeah, interestingly, fairies get the move that instantly vaporizes undead. Uh, Holy Bolt down here. Meanwhile, angels uh, get the ability to put one holy spell on them and then have two songs that will uh, just heal undead and uh, get rid of MP. They're very unusual. <laughs> it's like getting rid of MP, okay, that can shut down some stuff. Why do they heal undead? I would have thought, if anything, they just insta-kill undead, but oh well. Um, I think that about covers everything I wanted to cover in this one. Aside from the fact that I saw a really hilarious name, and, I, and I'm hoping I'll remember to put the name in, but some of the some of the random names you run into the remake are just priceless. Like, there is legit just some lady named Tittles in one of, uh, uh, one of the ones here. And yeah, that's... Shockingly, they didn't get deployed on the same team as somebody named Boner or any of that. But... Anyway, hopefully this was useful. Hope you guys found it interesting. And, um, and yeah, have yourselves a good one. Take care.